Rhetorical Quest. The last video was a little different. It was a little different because you didn't get to see my smiling face or look at my fat dummy. Uh, you mostly saw the screen and I kind of took you through a little bit of how we can get some of our in artistic proofs. Remember, our in artistic proofs are part of the canon of invention. There are five canons, invention, style, arrangement, memory, and delivery. And the first canon, invention, includes our artistic and inartistic proofs. Our inartistic proofs are our research. And I want to continue to just talk a little bit about research. Uh, I want to continue and just kind of add a little bit more about that. See, in our last video, we went through and I kind of showed you how to go about getting research and how to find some of the better stuff as far as your research goes. In this one, I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about you've got it all and you've written it down, you've printed it out, and whatever you're going to do with it, what now? What do we do now that we've that we've uh, got all of our got all of our research? Well, we need to start out by categorizing. Now, there's different ways of categorizing research, but I think a really simple way to do it is to put our sources together in three types. Those three types are okay sources, good sources, and excellent sources. Now, in some of your minds back there, you're thinking, well, aren't there some really bad sources of research? Well, that depends on the extent to which you use them. If you learn uh, because uh, your best friend's mother told you that if you eat a spoonful of molasses every Thursday, you will live to be 108, that's not all that great. Unless it's backed up by a whole bunch of other research. So here's the thing. Just because your mom told you something, that doesn't mean it's, it's a bad source. I bet most of the things your mom's, mom told you were true. No. Bad sources are only bad if they're used kind of by themselves. So what are these different kinds of sources? Well, there's our OK sources. These are a lot of times the first sources we go to, the first sources where we start to learn things. Most encyclopedias. That includes the World Book Encyclopedias and also Wikipedia on your computer. Both of these things are encyclopedias, and they're okay. If I'm wondering, hmm, when did Led Zeppelin stop naming their, all their albums Led Zeppelin? I can't remember. Was it seven? Was it eight? I, I don't know. I, I can hop online, go to Wikipedia. Oh, now I know. Isn't that great? Uh, that's wonderful. Now I know. I can do that. Uh, and sometimes that's an okay place to get our sources. Encyclopedias, dictionaries. Dictionaries are just fine. A lot of times when I just want to know the meaning of a word, I look it up in the dictionary. Hopefully you learned that in about third grade, that this is a good place to get research. But it's not really deep research. You just get a quick definition there. Popular magazines. Guess what? If you learn something by reading Cosmo, it's better to tell your audience that you learned it from reading Cosmo than to plagiarize and not tell where you got it. We learn things from fictional books. We learn things from TV shows, from movies. Uh, we learn things that we get, that we see in commercials. How do I know that four out of five dentists would prefer to ride it? I know it because I saw it on a commercial. And so there it was. That's, that's the only evidence I have for it. I don't even know if it's completely true, but I did see it on a commercial. So I think it might be. Uh, official corporate communications, which include commercials, it also includes like the brochures that you get from, from companies and you get something from a cell phone provider and you look it up and there's a map of their coverage area. You know, you kind of got to take it with a grain of salt. Uh, it's not unbiased research by any stretch of the imagination. They're trying to sell you a cell phone, right? Uh, so, you know, you kind of throw it out. And also unchecked research. You know, I have a blog. Uh, I can put all things, kinds of things on here. Uh, I use my YouTube site for more than just these videos, which are, you know, kind of 
uh, for more academic purposes. But you know, I, I put all kinds of videos on here and some of them could be crazy. Uh, unchecked research is not all that great. Unchecked research is research which hasn't been peer-reviewed. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what peer-reviewed research means as we get on to the excellent sources. So what's the purpose of OK sources? You know what? They can provide an artifact that you're analyzed. If you're going to give me a speech on how superhero movies have affected uh, society, you better quote some superhero movies or I'm not going to think you really did your research. Uh, they can be the artifact analyzed, or they can be a source of fun, pithy quotes, or anecdotes, little stories. Uh, that's fine. I, I, I've seen a lot of students start out their speeches with a quote from the dictionary. What is heritage? Well, according to what well, you know, what then that's a great way to kind of get into it. And it is okay to use the sources that way. If these okay sources, these fictional books and dictionaries and encyclopedias become the bulk of your research, you really haven't done very much and it's not that good. Better than okay research are what I call, or okay sources, are what I call the good sources. Good sources include things like philosophical texts. You noticed, I quote Aristotle on a regular basis in this class. I quote Cicero on a regular basis in this class. These things are good sources. They really can help you understand something. If something is, has stayed the test of time and for you know, 2,000 years it's been true, boy, that lends a lot of credence to it, doesn't it? If a lot of people have gotten a lot out of it for a long, long time, Canonical literature is generally considered a good source. Now, uh, did Shakespeare good, do good science? No, but he said some good things. So go ahead and quote him. Uh, he created a lot of the, the terms that we use fairly often in our English language and really came up with some things that, that make you think. So it's fine. Canonical literature is literature that experts in the field of literature say these, this is standing the test of time, this is good. Religious texts. Some people are afraid to quote from religious texts. And I think that's just kind of silly. We get lots of good information from our religions. If we didn't, we wouldn't have religions anymore. As long as people are getting a lot out of them, the texts are going to be good, they're going to be useful, and we need to keep using them. Things like news magazines, news shows, newspapers, these things that we call news. Now let me tell you a little something about the news. It's not a great source, okay? Uh, at best, news sources uh, have an editor and a fact checker that kind of look things over and see that they're kind of true as nearly as I can tell. But every newspaper, every news magazine, has at the end this little section called retractions. And those retractions are, oh, we made a mistake about all of this stuff last week. Great, so you made a mistake. What if I didn't read this article but didn't see their retraction? Uh, what if all of these news sources, uh, whether they're online, on TV, uh, on the newspapers, magazines, however you're getting them, they're good. They're really good. How do I know a lot of things that I know are going on in the world? How do I find out what the president and Congress are talking about? Usually I know these things through the newspapers or the, through the news television. That's how I know it, and that's okay. It's in fact good. Nonfiction books. Now we're going to separate these out a little bit from what we call scholarly books that we'll talk about in a second. But you know what? Sometimes somebody is really interested in something, they gather a lot of information on it, they write a book about the subject, and they're not an expert in the field, but they know a lot about that little subject. So they write a book, and it's interesting, and it's a good source. Also, like some trade journals. Uh, now, some trade journals are actually excellent sources, and we'll talk about that in just a few seconds. But most trade journals, you know what? If you read uh, Sugar Beet Farmers Monthly and you want to know about the latest trends in sugar beet farming, you got a pretty good source there. Now, they don't 
publish the stuff that's done at the agricultural universities that get really deep into it. They don't. That doesn't go into Sugar Beet Farmers Monthly. That's not the audience. It's not for scientists. It's not for people doing hardcore research like you can be doing. No, but it does give you a lot of basic information. Now these good sources, philosophical texts, canonical literature, literature texts, uh, religious texts, news sources, nonfiction books, government documents are another good source. Uh, does the government ever lie to people? Um, yeah, they do. Uh, I love my government, love my country, but you know what? There, there are people in the government sometimes out, to, out for their own gain. And so government documents aren't awesome, perfect sources, but they're they're pretty good. Trade journal stuff like that. These can provide the means of political, ethical, or historical justification for what you're saying. And that's what they're really good for. They are not, however, excellent sources. You remember before when I said that encyclopedias are okay sources? Well, there are a few times in an encyclopedia where you have what you call a signed entry. And a signed entry means that an expert in the field did true original research in order to create that. And in those rare cases, you would have an author. See, most encyclopedia entries don't really have an author so much. Well, when you do have an author and you've got a, a signed entry, it seems to be an excellent source. The bulk of excellent sources are scholarly journals. We talked about that last time and how to get access to those. You need to get access to scholarly journals if you're going to be doing college level speaking or above. Uh, you need to be able to go out and get those things and read those articles that are sometimes hard and dense to, 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 to look at, but they're good. And scholarly books as well. Sometimes it's hard to tell whether you've got a nonfiction book or a scholarly book. Uh, the best way to tell is if it comes from a scholarly publisher, it's a scholarly book. But sometimes it's hard to tell whether or not it's a scholarly publisher. A kind of second rule that I use is if you open it up and at the end of every chapter there's a reference or bibliography or in notes section, boy, that can be a pretty good indication of a scholarly book. It's not 100% because a few people will fake it out and use fake research and make it look good. It can be hard to tell sometimes, uh, but that's, that's one of the tools that you can use. Some trade journals are excellent sources. I mean, we could say that the Journal of American Medicine, for instance, is just a trade journal for doctors, but it's for doctors. And it tends to have good scholarly research. So what makes something a scholarly journal or a scholarly book? Or what makes this particular journal, trade journal, why is it making scholarly research where others are not? Well, the difference there is something called peer review. Peer review is when research has been done and it's submitted first to an editor. Now that that was true of some of our news sources and the good sources. The editor kind of looks it over, makes sure that it's all perfect, kind of nods their head, and if it really is, they don't just sign off on it and send it away like they do with the good sources. Now, in these excellent sources, things are peer-reviewed. And in peer-reviewed sources, it means they're sent to at least three other experts in the field besides the person who wrote it originally and the editor. Three other experts in the field. And these experts, what their job is, is, is to look at this research and make sure that all the methods were used properly, uh, all the tools were used in the right way, all the writing is done according to the scholarly conventions of that field. And these experts in the field say, you know what, this is really believable research. You don't have to be an expert in the field, but if you're reading peer-reviewed research, not only did an expert write it and an expert editor decide it was okay, three other experts in the field, usually people with terminal degrees, those are PhDs in that field, have said, you know what, this is good stuff. 
sometimes you can do that research yourself. Primary research, experiments you do, interviews, participant observations, scientific surveys, uh, carefully controlled experiments like that. Sometimes you can do those yourselves. Now here's the thing. In order to learn to do those, I think you need to take a graduate level research course. And that is beyond the scope of these videos. So if you're not ready to take a graduate level research course to do some of that research on your own, just trust the scholarly research that other people are doing. And that's generally the best way to go. The scholarly research, these excellent sources, put a person's ideas in their overall place in academic communication. They're what really provide the proof that you need. They show that you, the person being interviewed, whatever it is you've read, are not just making this stuff up. It's all been checked again and again and again by experts in the field. Now, a lot of people make some mistakes. There are a few common mistakes that I find in undergraduate research. One common mistake is when a student will find a poll, usually in a newspaper, uh, that was kind of taken of the readers of that newspaper. And then they'll accidentally present it as a statistic. Now, a poll isn't a statistic. A poll is just kind of the opinion of the people who felt strong enough to call in. True statistics done in academic journals are much more difficult and much more rigorous to obtain. Sometimes there will be a statistic in a newspaper. And there's the thing. If that really happens, that statistic generally came from somewhere else, and the newspaper, news magazine, or news source usually tells where they got it. You have to go back to the original source. Go to the library, get in their, get in their databases, and find the original source. Another common mistake is people have a lot of the good and a lot of the okay sources, but sometimes they lack those excellent sources. Uh, those ex without those excellent sources, you know, it can be really hard to prove your point. Sometimes students will try and go ahead and do their own primary research. And like I said before, if you haven't had a graduate course in research methods, you might not know what's going on there. And so you might not really know how to do a true survey. Um, a common mistake comes from the fact that the word random is used in slang to mean something more like arbitrary, when true randomness is incredibly difficult to achieve. Sometimes students fail to cite their sources. It happens quite a bit that people get up and say things. And they came from somewhere, but they don't tell me where. Or they'll treat an irregular anecdote as a representative anecdote. I couldn't tell you how many speeches I've heard about smoking where somebody says, well, my grandma smoked for 50 years and she never got cancer. Yeah, sometimes people smoke for a long time and they don't get sick, but most of the time they do. Okay, and so you have to make sure that your personal story is a normal story. And sometimes it gets hard to, to separate our experience from what's true. And it gets difficult sometimes. Sometimes students will cite common sense. Well, it's just obvious, isn't it? No. It's not obvious until you've done the research to, in order to prove it. Then it becomes obvious. How can we avoid these mistakes? Well, let me tell you a few things. First of all, use as many excellent sources as you can. Don't cite a citation if you can avoid it. Don't assume that the facts speak for themselves. You might need to explain the facts. And don't just assume because something is in print, because it was on the web, because it was on TV, because it was in your newspaper, that it was true. People make mistakes all the time. Make sure that your sources are verified by other excellent sources. Uh, try not to cite things out of context. And always treat your audience with respect. One little rule I try to use in order to make sure that I don't make these kind of mistakes 
Because I always think, what if there's somebody out there in my audience who knows more about the subject than I do? If that person knows more about the subject than I do, which on these videos is actually fairly likely, if somebody knows more about the subject than I do, and I get out there and act like I know it all, and I cite from this and cite from that, and uh, but none of it's good sources, I'm going to get caught. And when I get caught, I could get in trouble. So if you treat your audience with respect and use the excellent sources whenever you can, you know what good sources are, are really good. I love, I love Aristotle. I love Cicero. I love Jesus. Uh, and I, I cite from them all in these video series. And, and they're re they really are good. And once in a while, I'll bring in those excellent sources too. If I treat you with respect, act like you can go figure out whether or not I'm telling you the truth, we can go a lot further. And that's what I'm expecting for you to do in your research. And I'm looking forward to it. And I'm looking forward to hearing about how you use these ideas. Okay, good and excellent sources. In our next video, we're going to leave behind the part of invention that deals with these inartistic proofs and start to get into some of the really fun stuff, which is the artistic proofs, our logic, building our character, using emotion. So I'll look forward to seeing you in our next video.